it'll never get done. When was the last time you said or thought that? Uh, maybe it was about a DIY project you've been ignoring or struggling with. It'll never get done. Uh, I remember thinking that uh, every time I opened my textbooks to revise for university exams. It'll never get done. Sometimes it didn't. Maybe we felt this about the auditorium project at points. Big job, big costs. It's impossible. It'll never get done. Well, the project that we've been thinking about with Ezra's help over the last few Sundays is, of course, much, much bigger than any of those. It's glorious. A living temple in which God himself dwells. It's global, made up of living stones, of people from all over the world. It's intimidating. Opposition is lined up against the work. Hostile religions, hostile governments, hostile neighbours. And the workforce is, shall we say, unimpressive? I speak for myself. If I was going to recruit for the biggest building project in human history, I wouldn't start with me. Would you start with someone like you? When Jesus first gave the, the great global gospel commission in Matthew 28, to that small group of very ordinary people, as they heard the scale of the task being outlined for them, make disciples of all nations, disciples who would together form this living temple for God's dwelling, we could forgive them, couldn't we, for thinking, no chance. It'll never happen. This building project here in Ezra is a model in miniature of that living temple that God is building today all over the world as he joins people to Christ through the spread of the gospel and faith in Christ. If you told the exiles in Babylon that by Ezra chapter 6, not only would the people of God be back home in Jerusalem, but they'd be celebrating a finished, rebuilt temple, no chance. It's impossible. And yet that's exactly what happened. How? As Ezra answers that question for us, we're going to learn how we can be sure that God's great, glorious, global gospel project will be completed today too. We're going to listen to the story together in four scenes. Scene number one, the eye of the Lord. The eye of the Lord. Chapter 5, verses 3 to 5. So there you are with your uh, hard hat on and your trowel in your hand. You're happily working away alongside your fellow Israelites. When a car pulls up, two important looking men in suits get out, credentials round their neck and clipboards in hand, and they stride up to the Israelite project managers. Gulp. Who are they? Why are they here? What do they want? Well, verse, uh, verse 3 tells us there in chapter 5. It's Tatanai and Shetha Bozanai. They're the governors of the province. And they want to know who's authorised the people to continue the building work. Verse 3, who gave you a decree to build this house? Now, the last decree we read about in the account was chapter 4, verse 21. Artaxerxes' decree that the work be stopped by force. Gulp. And now they're taking down the names of the builders. They approach you, they ask for your name, and you nervously give it, and they write it down, and they move on to the guy next to you. Gulp. What are they going to do with those names? These are powerful men, and they have access to an even more powerful man, King Darius, head of a superpower. He's the, the Xi Jinping of his day. Uh, teachers among us will know all about inspection anxiety, those dreaded words. Ofsted are coming. But then so do many of our brothers and sisters around the world. Gathering today in fear of government inspection and government closure and government prosecution. Sermons checked beforehand for state orthodoxy. Who gave you permission to say these things about the Lord Jesus in public? Just imagine how we'd feel if there were government officials insisting on sitting in on our services, or watching what we prayed, watching what we sung, watching what we preached. 
But there's someone even more powerful watching over us too. More powerful than those inspectors, or Darius the king, or your boss at work, or the prime minister. Look at verse 5. But the eye of their God was on the elders of the Jews. It speaks of God's love, his care, his protection, how he watches over his people as they serve him. It's the, the loving watchfulness of a parent as their son or daughter learns to ride a bike, ready to steady them, to step in, to protect them from doing themselves harm. Do you see his loving protection here in Ezra? But why are we told there in verse 5 that these governors don't stop the people of God immediately? Because the eye of their God was on them watching over them as they served him. What an encouragement that is to us today. As we try to spread the good news of the Lord Jesus in what is often a suspicious environment. What does it matter in the end who else is watching us if our God is watching over us? Our Heavenly Father knows what we need. He's well able to provide and to protect as the song puts it, when Jesus is my portion, a constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. His eye is on us, and his hand is behind and before us. That's our second scene, the hand of the Lord. We've had the eye of the Lord, now the hand of the Lord. Chapter 5, verse 6, until chapter 6, verse 5. So what did these men report to King Darius? This notice is a critical moment in the progress of the project, and all because of who Darius is. He's a king. Later on, count how many times the word king is emphasised in the account. Not just a constitutional monarch with symbolic power, but an international sovereign with access to crushing power. Did you notice as we heard the letter read, it feels different to the letter in chapter 4. The letter we thought about last week in chapter 4 was a masterclass in manipulation. But here this time there are no accusations, no preposterous list of signatories. There's no pressing of the king's buttons. At Tatanai and Shetha Bosnai, it seems, were just doing their job. They speak respectfully about God. Verse 8, the great God. They even let the people of God speak for themselves. Notice how they quote them there in verses 11 to 16. It's worth looking closely at what they quote them as saying. Notice how the people of God refer to the Lord. Verse 11, we are the servants of the God of heaven and earth. Not just a local Israelite deity. Heaven and earth there stands for all of creation. He is God everywhere. And did you notice how they explain the exile? Verse 12, the God of heaven gave them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. So they mentioned the role of their captain, Nebuchadnezzar, but who was really in charge? It was the God of heaven. Even in the horror of exile, when everything seemed to have fallen apart, they recognized the hand of the Lord. And these are the words of a people absolutely persuaded that God is totally and utterly and completely sovereign. They're learning to read their past theologically, that what, have, what had happened to them in the past may have had secondary causes, like Nebuchadnezzar. But the ultimate explanation for their past, the primary cause, the one in sovereign control of all of it, exile included, was the Lord, the God of heaven and earth. I wonder whether we think about our own lives in this way. When we think about our own lives, all of the secondary causes that have shaped our lives, the decisions that we've made, the people we've met, the places we've lived. Do we see that the ultimate cause is the sovereignty of God? Not only the happy times, but the hard times too, all directed by his loving hand. What about our church's story? 150 years of ups and downs. Our pastors and members have come and gone. Have the building's changed, it's changing again. Do we see the hand of the Lord behind our church's story? What about the world? When we consider human history with all of its secondary causes, 
shaping it, powerful people, cultural trends, technological advances, global pandemics. Are we able to see the primary cause? The sovereign hand of God. Do we see what the Bible's telling us? Human history is being steered by his hand to fulfill his gospel purposes. When we begin to read the past that way, we'll learn to read the future that way as well. We'll grow a calm confidence in the sovereignty of the Lord to steer the world and the church and our lives in the direction that he chooses. You see how he does that here in Ezra? The governors sign their letter and send it off, asking the king to search for Cyrus's decree, granting permission originally. And lo and behold, in Cyrus's summer house in Ekbatana, in western Iran, in the treasury, they find a scroll. What a coincidence! No. It's the hand of the Lord. And his hand at work in Babylon, notice. He isn't just God in Israel, but in Babylon too. He doesn't just order events for his purposes in Jerusalem, but in Ekbatana too. He isn't just God of the church either. We, we, we're seeing this, aren't we, in Ephesians. In Ephesians 1, a couple of Sundays ago, we saw how Jesus has a special relationship with the church as his body. But that God has placed all things and all places under Jesus' feet. He is sovereign over the church and over the world. When I walk into church, I can say, the Lord Jesus is sovereign here. And I, when I walk into my house, I can say, the Lord is sovereign here. And into my workplace, I can say, the Lord is sovereign here. And into the hospital as I wait for results. And into the job interview. And into the school or into the theatre. I can say, the Lord is sovereign here. His hand is in control. Every place we take the gospel... We're walking on God's land. This has given gospel workers confidence for centuries. Everywhere I take the good news of the Lord Jesus, whether it's across the ocean or across the street, I can say he is sovereign here. As the Lord Jesus himself said in Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. Everything directed by his hand. And everything follows his decree. Scene three. Scene number three, the decree of the Lord. Now, chapter six, verses six to 15. Regular readers of the Bible will know that a good place to start in understanding any part of scripture is to look for repeated words. And in chapter six, verses six to 15, we find five times the word decree. We find it about 12 times in our passage as a whole. Remember, this is the question that the inspectors asked back in chapter 5 and verse 3. Who gave you a decree to build this house? Now, having found Cyrus's scroll in the treasury, King Darius now makes his own decree, and it's extraordinary. We see it there in chapter 6 and verse 6 onwards. And not only does he grant permission for the work to continue, you see that in verse 7, let the work on this house of God alone, let them rebuild, he throws in both provision and protection as well. A provision, verses 8 to 10. A cost to, to be paid in full and without delay for the building work. And then throwing in all of the animals needed for temple sacrifice. Whatever is needed, verse 9. And look at the protection that he grants in verses 11 to 12. Anyone fiddling with his royal orders will be impaled on a beam from his own house. It's the sort of thing they did back then. And it doesn't matter how important they are either, verse 12, even kings should think twice before interfering. What an outcome this is. Better than the people could possibly have hoped for. But then this is what the Lord does, isn't it? He turns troubles into gospel triumphs. And this is the same God, remember, who turned a crucifixion into a resurrection. It's what he does. And in surprising ways. Using surprising people. Cyrus and Darius weren't necessarily believers. In fact, when God promised back in Isaiah 45 to use Cyrus for his purposes, he says, Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, I equip you, though you do not know me. He's an ally disguised as an adversary. The Lord uses people who don't know him to serve his purposes. 
even Judas, even Pontius Pilate, even the evil Roman Empire, those lovely straight Roman roads along which Paul would speed with the gospel, himself a Roman citizen enjoying Roman protection. Now, if that's the case, can't the Lord Almighty use today our political leaders for his gospel purposes? Can't he use unbelieving bosses at work as we look to to share the good news of Christ? Maybe unbelieving premises managers? They may make their own decrees, but there is one decree governing all of human history. It's the decree of the God of Israel. Look at verse 14 with me. Verse 14. They finished their building by decree of the God of Israel and by decree of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. Those kings played their part, their significant part, but one decree rules over all, the decree of our sovereign God. This is the confidence that we have, that God's gospel project will be completed. He has said so. The God of heaven and earth has decreed that his house will be built. Jesus has spoken, I will build my church. And when it's finished, it'll be time to celebrate. Scene four, the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord. Chapter six, verses 16 to the end. Well, what a scene this is. The people, the priests, verse 16, The Levites and the rest of the returned exiles celebrated the dedication of this house of God with joy. I think we've had a little taste of this uh, today, haven't we? Finally singing together again. Isn't it great? This is the joy here of restored worship. The joy of God's presence with them in a completed temple. The joy of sins forgiven through sacrifice. The joy of priests representing the people to God. This joy in Ezra here is the joy of rescue. As they celebrate the Passover, a new exodus, freedom from slavery, restoration to God. It's the joy of knowing that it's all because of the Lord. See that in verse 22. They kept the Feast of Unleavened Bread with joy for the Lord. The Lord had made them joyful and had turned the heart of the king of Assyria to them so that he aided them in the work of the house of God, the God of Israel. And the joy we we read about here in chapter 6 is just a glimpse of the joyful celebration there will be when God's gospel project will be completed. When people from every tongue, tribe and nation gather around the throne of the Lord Jesus in a new creation, a glorious global temple and shout together for joy at God's finished work of salvation. I imagine we'll sing many different kinds of songs on that day. But here's one example. Revelation 7 verse 10. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Salvation belongs to our God. He has done it by divine decree. A glorious and eternal dwelling place made up of living stones from all over the world and all of human history gathered together in joyful worship of our sovereign God and the Passover lamb who was slain. On that day, there will be no doubt. It was the Lord. So, Christian, are you looking forward to that day? It's coming. It's certain. Because God has said so. Remember that when the work is hard and the opposition is loud. When you feel like giving up and giving in, trust your sovereign God. Trust his loving eye over you, his strong hand behind and before you, his sovereign decree governing each and every moment. Trust him to turn trouble into triumph. As we play our our small part in God's glorious gospel project, as we reach out with the gospel, as we build each other up in the gospel, as we send people out with the gospel all over the world, as we renovate the auditorium for gospel purposes, as we meet in unusual venues like this, let's trust our sovereign God, his eye over us, his hand behind and before us, and his decree governing everything, large and small. 
And if you're not a Christian, did you notice some uh, unexpected guests at the celebration? Uh, verse 21 tells us who was there. Have a look down with me. It's a celebratory feast, verse 21. Eaten by the people of Israel who'd returned from exile. Who else? And also by everyone who had joined them and separated himself from the uncleanness of the peoples of the land to worship the Lord, the God of Israel. Those previously outsiders, newcomers, seeing the sovereign hand of the Lord at work for themselves, the glory of his temple, the goodness of belonging to him, being one of his people, being part of this glorious thing he's doing in the world, and then wanting to be part of it for themselves. Is that you? Will you hear God's invitation to you today? Come in. Be part of it. Come to Christ in faith. Become a living stone in this spiritual house that God is building all over the world. It's not finished yet. People are being added to it every day from every nation on earth. It's not finished yet, but by divine decree, one day it will be. And when that day comes, what a celebration there will be. Let's pray. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we praise you because we know that all of salvation is your work from beginning to end. We know that it was your sovereignty that had the Lord Jesus take our sins upon himself on the cross and so arrange human history that all of that would happen in just the right way. It was your sovereignty that's got the gospel from there to us so many miles away. Your sovereignty, your sovereign control, which woke us up to the gospel and brought us back to you. And it will be your sovereign power, your glorious strong hand, which finishes this glorious gospel work and empowers us as we play our part in it. And so we pray that in the days to come, in this week to come, you would give us great confidence in your sovereign control. Give us boldness as we speak the gospel to each other and to those outside too. Father, we, we pray, please add many to your glorious building. And may Jesus come soon. In Jesus' name, amen.